Hey, and thank you very much for joining the Erie 2020 annual conference. I'm John Vickers, based here this afternoon in uh, Oxford University, and it's a great pleasure to declare this our 47th annual conference open. So good afternoon or good morning, good evening, wherever you may be, and thank you again for being with us. We're, this is taking place in virtual Bologna by Zoom. Of course, we all wish we were in um, actual Bologna. And I do want to pay tribute uh, to all those who've made it possible for us to gather uh, in this way, dictated by the circumstances that surround us. I'll say more at the General Assembly tomorrow afternoon, but let me highlight uh, straight away all the work that Leslie Marks and her scientific committee have done, Luca Lambertini and the local organizing committee in Bologna, and Eni Canel, uh, the Secretariat of Erie. Thanks also to our sponsors, to all our speakers and moderators, and uh, to all of you attending this gathering. As of yesterday, we had more than 400 registrations and that number was climbing. And we are recording this year's conference so that it'll be possible for people to view the content afterwards as well. As you know, we've got a streamlined program relative to a normal Erie conference with in each of the next three afternoons European time, we have a, a plenary session followed by two invited paper sessions. So compact, but uh, I hope it will be very stimulating and high quality. Now the way to, you want to begin any conference is with a great speaker and a great topic. And I was really thrilled when Natalia Fadra accepted the invitation uh, to give uh, one of the plenary lectures at this year's gathering. Natalia is a professor at uh, University of Carlos Tre in Ma Madrid. Her PhD was from uh, the EUI in Florence. She has a host of other academic affiliations, too many for me to run through. But let me highlight uh, one of her policy affiliations too, which is as a member of the Economic Advisory Group on Competition Policy of the European Commission uh, in Brussels. She has won various prizes, one of those being for the best young Spanish economist. She has a string of editorial roles, including with the Economic Journal and the Journal of Industrial Economics. She's the holder of a, a major ERC grant on energy markets. We'll be hearing about that this afternoon. And the corpus of her research work over the years it is very broad. It spans and brings together um, industrial organization, auctions, both theory and empirics, and with a particular focus on energy markets and the links through to environmental economics. And that indeed is the topic of her lecture. Uh, no topic could be uh, more important than this, and it is the energy transition. So the next hour or so, the floor is going to be Natalia's. The way it works with Q&A, if we have time, is that if you log any questions that you might have using the Q&A function, I will keep an eye on that. And then at the end, or possibly even if there's a natural break point during the lecture, I will then feed in uh, questions as we go. But with huge thanks, Natalia, the, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, John. It's uh, truly a great pleasure to be giving this uh, keynote lecture. As you said, we would like to be in Bologna, but here we are. I'm also very grateful to all those who made uh, this possible. It's also a great pleasure to be uh, sharing with you uh, the research that uh, together with an amazing team of co-authors I've been working on over the last years on the energy transition. And, and my plan is to really uh, try to convey that this is an exciting area for IO economists uh, to be uh, working on it. So I'm going to be talking about uh, the energy transition. Let me jump into a formal definition of what we mean with the energy transition, which is nothing but a roadmap uh, towards uh, a full decarbonization of our energy uh, system, which requires the substitution of fossil fuel uh, sources uh, with zero carbon sources, together with an overall improvement uh, in energy efficiency. Uh, this uh, process certainly involves all the sectors 
of the economy, but today I'll be focusing on one. I'll be focusing on the power sector. And the reason why is essentially it's the sector that I know best, but also because the power sector is a key sector in the energy transition. First, because it can rely on, on renewables in order to clean up itself. And second, because other sectors that find it more difficult to rely on renewables, uh, they can uh, rather rely on electricity in order to also decarbonize uh, themselves. Uh, technology breakthroughs over the last uh, years have made this process easier. We have seen massive cost reductions in renewables as well as in uh, storage, meaning that as of today, it's even uh, the, the cost, the, the, the average cost of, of renewables are even uh, cheaper than the uh, marginal cost of the conventional sources, meaning that uh, there's an environmental reason for why we want to uh, make uh, this energy transition, but there's also powerful economic reasons of why we want to move um, into uh, renewables. As you know well, the, Europe, the, the energy transition is already uh, underway. Uh, environmental and energy targets are at the top of the policy agenda uh, in Europe and also in the US. In Europe, at the end of last year, uh, the European Commission announced its European Green Deal. The plan is to expand uh, 1 trillion euro over the next three decades in order uh, to become, uh, uh, in order to achieve the net zero emission target by 2050. More recently, we have seen uh, through the announcement of the European Recovery Fund that the climate action is certainly also key, it's going to be key for the economic recovery. In the United States, uh, we've seen California taking the lead in, uh, in climate action. Uh, the plan is that by 2040, 90% of uh, electricity generation is going to be uh, carbon free. And just last week, uh, we uh, had uh, uh, John Biden's announcing its uh, climate plan. If he's elected, uh, he, has, he, he plans to spend over three trillion US dollars over the next three decades, also to add a net zero emissions by 2050, and to achieve an even more ambitious objective than the one in California, which is to achieve this 90% carbon-free electricity target, uh, but earlier on, uh, in 2030, only in 15 years' time. And believe me, time goes by very quickly. So it's very reassuring that we are seeing this increasing uh, ambition in setting the objectives. But as economists, we know well that setting objectives, while it is uh, necessary, it's certainly not sufficient. We need to put in place policies uh, that are uh, effective and good enough in order to achieve these objectives at least cost. So I think that our role as economists and certainly our role as, as industrial economists is to shed light on, on the how question. Which are these policies? How should we design these policies in order to achieve uh, the energy transition as, as well as to achieve it in an efficient um, way? So my plan for today is to overview what I believe are the key regulatory changes to decarbonize uh, power markets as a necessary condition to decarbonize the whole economy. And for that purpose, I'm going to be describing some of our recent uh, papers that address these challenges. And you will have to forgive me for not having the time to go through the contribution that many other uh, scholars have also uh, made in this field. I'll be happy at the end of the talk if I uh, convince some of you to really go into these uh, fields. I honestly believe that uh, this area provides uh, exciting opportunities uh, for us, for our economists. I don't need to convince you that this is a highly policy relevant uh, area to which we can uh, certainly contribute because many of the topics that I'm going to be uh, talking about during my talk are really at the heart of IO. I'll be talking about competition, market power, incentives, market design, entry, investment. Uh, and we can uh, analyze uh, these issues both theoretically as well as empirically, thanks to the fact that uh, these markets provide very large and highly detailed uh, uh, data sets that allow us to shed light on these uh, questions from an empirical perspective. Believe me, there's many policymakers and practitioners out there uh, that don't have the answers to all the questions and they are eager to know our answers. So we need to provide solution fast. And I think the best way to do it is through rigorous research. So let me first uh, discuss, uh, give an overview of what I believe are, in a nutshell, the main key regulatory challenges that have also guided the research that we have been performing over the last uh, few years. Let me classify them in three blocks. The first one regards market performance. 
So if, if we really believe that in 15 year time, in 15 years time, our uh, power sector is gonna be almost uh, carbon free, we really need to understand how these renewables dominated uh, markets uh, are going to work. Uh, for this purpose, we need to understand how renewable technologies are gonna compete in this market and how conventional technologies are gonna respond to this massive entry of, of renewable technologies. This is certainly very important to understand uh, what electricity prices are gonna be uh, looking like in, in the future, but also because these prices are gonna determine today's current investment incentives. And we need to understand whether the incentives are there currently uh, adequate or whether we need to do something about it, for instance, through through market design. This is why market design is the second block of issues that I'll be, I'll be talking about. Um, I would like to understand how competition and how the performance of these markets uh, depend on market design. Uh, and and this, is, this is a way to guide uh, policy design and market design uh, in this area. Uh, both, as I said, to understand uh, market performance, but also to understand whether firms are actually going to uh, uh, take on these investments and which type of technologies they are going to be choosing, because this is also going to be key to determine what are going to be the cost of these uh, energy transitions. Last, I'm going to be talking about the limits uh, to uh, renewables. As we all know, renewables are intermittent, meaning they, they come on and off. And this might create a mismatch between demand and supply. In electricity markets, demand and supply have to be equal uh, at all times. So we always have to have either enough capacity to meet demand or we need to have uh, flexible demand uh, uh, in order to uh, cope with changes in the uh, availability of the various energy sources. So how can we cope with this increasing weight of, of renewables? We can do it either through the demand side that is, face consumers with price signals so that they have incentives to move their demand from high demand periods, which is those periods when there's little renewables, to low price periods, which is those periods in which there's a lot of renewable energy. Or we can also do it through the supply side. Uh, we can go uh, and increase the existing amount of conventional capacity that we have in these markets. Probably that's not the right way to go, but we could also uh, invest in transmission capacity, essentially interconnecting the country so as to increase security of supply across all of us. Uh, but we can also, and this is going to be the focus of what I'll be uh, talking about, invest in storage so that we can store renewable electricity whenever there's lots of it and use it to cover demand uh, whenever there's little uh, renewable energy. So I'll be covering uh, these topics uh, by referring to the uh, papers that uh, together with uh, with a great team of co-authors we have uh, been working on. And, and clearly, I don't have the time to go into detail. So I'll, I'll be giving you the main takeaways, and I'll be more than happy to provide details uh, during the Q&A uh, session. So let me start um, with market performance. So the conventional wisdom is that renewable energy is going to depress electricity market prices. So what you can see here in this figure is uh, true data with demand and supply curves in electricity markets, which work as, as an option. The intersection between demand, uh, which is the blue line, and supply, which is the green line, determines the market clear and price, which is paid to all the uh, units that are producing at that moment of time. Uh, the conventional view is that elect uh, 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 renewables, because they have zero marginal costs, is a really cheap source of of power once we have invested in this technology will shift out the supply function, therefore leading to a reduction in the market clearing price. While this conclusion is correct, it's not that clear whether the magnitude of this uh, uh, price effect is as, as strong as the one uh, shown in this figure. And the reason is that there is no compelling reason why renewable electricity should be offered should be offering its output to the market at zero uh, marginal cost just as any other technology there's a scope for these technologies to be exercising market power uh, in this market so in order to understand how these markets will perform in order to understand what the consumers will be getting uh, cheaper electricity once we uh, uh, invest in renewables we really need to understand uh, what is the optimal bidding behavior of of, of firms in this new context in which there's an increasing weight uh, of renewables. And for that matter, we need to uh, build the new game that reflects this new context. And we need to understand what is the equilibrium behavior in this market. 
So um, uh, the one feature that uh, we highlight is that uh, competition-wise, uh, renewables are very different uh, to conventional energy sources uh, for one main reason, which is the fact that uh, whereas uh, most of the literature in electricity markets when dealing with uh, conventional energy, they typically assume that the cost of conventional technology uh, uh, might have some privately uh, known uh, cost components, but their capacities are known, essentially because uh, marginal costs depend on, on the price they pay for the fossil fuel, and the capacity of these technologies is almost always available, so, so we know uh, what their capacity is. When it comes to renewables, matters are different. Why? Because the marginal cost of renewables are known to be zero. Why? Because essentially they're using freely available uh, resources. To the contrary, their capacities are privately known because even though we might know the maximum capacity, say, of a windmill, their available capacity depends on local weather conditions which are uh, difficult to forecast uh, and which uh, only uh, the owners of these plants have uh, better information, say, the information they obtain from the meteor stations on site in order to provide these, these forecasts as to how much they're going to be um, able to produce. Um, so, so we understand that the move from fossil fuel to renewable um, electricity is going to change, it's going to bring a new competitive paradigm in electricity markets. So we have to move from games that assume private information on cost to games that assume private information uh, on capacities. And, and by the way, there's many other examples uh, in I.O. in which um, it's, it's also probably accurate to think of, of, of firms having private information on capacities. And just to mention some of them, think of hotels, uh, auctions for emissions permits, and uh, as, well as, as well as many others. So let me go through the, the main ingredients of, of, of the model that I have developed together with uh, Gerard Jarrett, in which we try to build up this new competitive paradigm and apply it to electricity markets to understand uh, competition among renewables. So the uh, streamlined version of the model goes as follows. Uh, we have a model in which we have two firms that are anti-symmetric. Um, these firms, they only have, they only own uh, renewable resources whose marginal costs are, are, are zero. Their capacities, denoted by Ki, are privately known by the owners. Demand in this market is assumed to be known and price inelastic, and there are some conventional suppliers, there's a fringe of conventional suppliers with, with a cost capital P, which essentially acts like an implicit price cap uh, in this market. The market is organized as most electricity markets in practice, that is through a uniform uh, price auction, meaning firms, they, they make, they submit their bids to the auctioneer who runs these bids from low to high and determines the market clearing price and the quantities uh, through uh, market clearing so that all the winning bids receive the market clearing price. We are assuming that renewals in the market, in this market, they are paid at market prices. Probably they can receive a, a fixed premium, but this is not, this would not be affecting the equity outcome uh, in any way. We assume that firms, they can offer one price quantity per, uh, meaning that uh, price P is the price, the minimum price at which they're willing to produce up to a certain quantity Q, uh, which can be lower than their available capacity, that is, we are allowing firms to possibly withhold uh, their output. The equilibrium concept that we are going to be characterizing is uh, Bayesian Nash equilibrium. So in the paper, among other things, what I would like to stress is, is the, the symmetric Bayesian Nash equilibrium period strategies that we find for the most compelling case, which is shown um, in this in this. Essentially, uh, firms, in this case, they never want to withhold output, and the price they want to set is shown in this figure, which is a function of the realized capacity. So, uh, if they have a very low capacity realization, essentially, they're going to be bidding at the marginal cost of the conventional suppliers, and as their capacity realization grows larger, they're willing to offer uh, lower prices down uh, to marginal cost. This essentially reflects a standard price quantity uh, trade-off uh, because if a firm has a large availability shock, uh, it's, it's, it gains more output by undercutting the rival because the gain from only serving the residual demand to serving that capacity is going to be uh, larger. These points on this uh, curve 
essentially anchor the optimal supply functions uh, that firms are going to be willing to offer in this market. For instance, if a firm has a capacity realization equal to 0 0.6, it's going to be offering all that capacity to the market at that price. And as the capacity realizations grow larger, the supply functions uh, shift uh, downwards. Uh, note that if instead of having uh, uh, private information on capacities, we had private information on cost, these supply functions would only be shifting uh, up and down. So what we find is that uh, the market and the market price is more elastic to capacity shocks than it would be to only uh, cost shocks. How does this translate into market performance? Uh, well, think of two examples. So in the short run for given capacities, what would happen at hours in which uh, there is little uh, renewable availability versus hours in which there's a lot of renewable availability. Clearly, the aggregate supply uh, curve in the market would shift down, leading to lower prices in the case in which there's more renewables. So clearly, as I mentioned uh, before, the conventional uh, wisdom that uh, renewals the first market prices is correct, uh, but uh, the magnitude of this uh, price depression is not as large because market power is mitigating the price depression effect of renewals. What we find is that uh, precisely because capacities are not known, uh, in contrast to what happened with conventional energy, uh, there's less market power than what we would have uh, uh, if these capacities were known. But the fact that there's private information implies that there's more market power than if this uh, capacity availability was completely random with no private information component. We can perform another comparative statics, which is uh, to increase overall investment. And what we find is that as, as we increase uh, overall investment, uh, these optimal bid functions shift out, leading to market prices smoothly going down. So that as we go along the energy transition and we increase our investment in renewable technologies, market prices will go down uh, towards uh, marginal cost. So it's difficult to validate these theoretical results empirically, essentially because we have not yet seen any market with such a high penetration of renewables. But I thought I could not be giving this lecture without uh, talking about COBIB. So the, this is my COBIB related uh, piece of evidence. Essentially what I did was uh, between February and August 2020, I collected all, all the hourly equilibrium prices in the Spanish electricity market, and I simply plot them against the share of carbon-free output. And essentially what we see is that uh, indeed, whenever the share of carbon-free output is greater, uh, market prices go down, they become uh, more uh, dispersed. So uh, what I get out of this, and clearly this is an area where we need uh, further research, and probably we can use this natural experiment to look more uh, into it, is, is whether these lower prices that we're going to see along the energy transition are going to be enough to support uh, today's uh, investment. So this is a textbook example in which marginal costs are below uh, average costs. So there is no reason why firms would be willing to invest, knowing that once they invest, prices are going to uh, be uh, going down below their average cost. So a key question, I believe one of the key questions of, of, of this area is whether uh, we can improve upon uh, this outcome through, through market design. And this brings me to the second block of the presentation on market design. I'm going to stop here in case there is any questions you, need, you want me to clarify right now. So in, um, John Vickers here, um, there are no open questions in Q&A uh, that I can see on my screen, but could I ask one sort of background question about the, the rest of the current energy mix? So, I mean, nuclear is non-carbon and there's still quite a lot of carbon. And in your last slide, it was as though non-carbon is about half. I mean, it, 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 it's very variable, but um, just a little bit of background on that. Yeah. Would, I think be quite interesting to have. Yeah, oh, obviously, yeah, clearly. Sorry if I went too fast. Um, so es essentially we have, uh, as you correctly pointed out, uh, carbon-free resources, which is renewables plus nuclear. In Spain, we have quite a lot of nuclear steel. It's going to be phase out, but as of today, we still have a lot of nuclear. Competition-wise, uh, this should not be affecting the whole picture because 
essentially in nuclear they're operating uh, at base load, meaning they cannot uh, really ramp up uh, and down. So their production is essentially exogenously given. So we can take it out and just work with a receivable demand if you want. The rest of it is made of gas. So gas is really um, uh, the buffer uh, in order to cope with uh, renewables inter intermittency. So whenever demand goes up and renewables goes down, the difference is, is covered uh, with gas. There are some storage facilities of which I'll be uh, talking on later on. As of now, uh, there is very little of them, but they're gonna be playing a, a major role in, in this picture. Thanks, and just if I may, one on the renewables, yeah. The composition of that between, I mean, it varies a lot geographically, of course, but yeah. just some remarks on that might, might, be, might be fascinating. Yeah, there is, it varies a lot. It depends on the availability of natural resources in each country. Um, in Spain, we have mainly uh, wind and also solar, uh, but in other countries, uh, you might have all the type of, of resources, including uh, um, uh, geothermal, or you can have biomass and, and the nature. So, so we are talking about renewables as if it was just one thing, but inside of it, there's, there's a huge variety of different technologies that behave very differently. Because whereas one can think of, of wind as something which is completely exogenous with a very low opportunity cost. Essentially, if you don't make use of that wind, it's gone. Uh, but if we think of water, water is storable and that makes a huge difference. Uh, so the economics of uh, renewable energy is also very rich. And even though I'll be talking about renewables in general, I think there's exciting questions regarding technology choices and what those choices uh, imply. I'll be, I'll be talking a little bit about that uh, in a minute. Great, and there's a, a question come in from Ren Hillard um, asking not just about the price performance, which you focused on, but um, the CO2 reduction aspect, that, that policy target. Um, maybe you'll come on to this about how much we can expect uh, enough uh, CO2 reduction to meet the policy, policy targets. But that's uh, an aspect that she has asked about. Yeah, I, I'm not, I'm not uh, really working on those issues. So rather my focus is they set these targets, they think these emissions reductions are enough in order to achieve the, the temperature increase that we think is compatible with uh, not making climate change uh, worse. Uh, so my approach is, if those objectives have been set, how can we achieve them uh, at least at least cost, okay? Fine. So thank, thanks very much. And wh why don't you um, keep going? Yeah. I'll keep on going. So uh, let me just talk briefly about uh, market design and in particular about market design towards renewables. Here there's many policy choices that we need to make. For instance, we need to understand whether we want to face renewables with market prices, volatile prices, as I just mentioned before, or whether we want to pay them according uh, to fixed prices that could be set, uh, for instance, uh, through auctions. So the regulator sets a quantity target and competition in these auctions sets the price at which investors are willing, are willing to take on that, those investments. An alternative is to choose a price instrument so that the regulator would choose uh, the price and given that price, investors will decide how much to invest. Another policy option is whether we wanna pay for energy or we wanna pay for uh, capacity. And another very relevant policy choice, I believe, which is related to your previous question, John, is whether we want to uh, follow a, a technology neutral approach or, or whether we want to treat uh, different technologies uh, in a different way. Clearly, all these choices have very important implications and there are many trade-offs in works. Let me just uh, focus on one here, which is the location of new investments to illustrate the importance of paying as a function of energy or as a function of, of capacity. Suppose that we pay investors as a function of, of their capacity, and we are thinking, for instance, of investments in, in wind. If I get the same payment regardless of where I, I locate, I'm not going to have incentives to locate in the, in the most uh, windy places. So if we pay as a function of capacity, we are going to get inefficient location decisions. But if we pay in terms of, of energy, uh, because different locations uh, have different wind availabilities, uh, probably we're gonna be given too high rents to those places that are uh, 
uh, highly windy that would not require that high prices in order to uh, be willing to invest. So, so here we might be facing a trade-off uh, between efficiency and rents that is reminiscent of many questions in I.O. to which I will come back uh, later on. Regarding the other implications, I'll be going uh, one by one, uh, illustrating the results with the research that we have been working on. Let me start with the first one, market power in the energy market and how that depends on how we pay for renewables in particular, on whether we pay them according to market prices or whether we pay them according to these fixed prices that are set uh, through an auction. By the way, let me just mention that the European Commission is advocating to exposing uh, renewables to these uh, market uh, prices. As you can see uh, in this map, it's very colorful because essentially different countries are resorting either to uh, one um, option um, or the other. So this question of whether we should uh, be exposing renewables to market prices or to fixed prices is, is, is the main topic of my paper uh, uh, with Imelda. And, and to summarize the main takeaway, let me say that uh, whenever we analyze the impact of, of fixed prices, say, on, on market power in, in this market, we highlight two countervailing effects. On the one hand, we find that paying rules according to fixed prices acts like a forward contract, uh, meaning that suppose that a generator has part of its production through conventional sources and the other part uh, through renewable sources, if the renewable energy already has a fixed price uh, ex ante, then whenever this producer is deciding whether to exercise market power in the energy market or not, it only internalizes the price effect through uh, the conventional uh, uh, market share. Therefore, its market power is, is weaker. It is as if the firm was virtually uh, smaller. So this is the, the well-known standard effect uh, first uh, uh, documented by, by Alas and Pika. On the other hand, if we pay renewable resources according uh, to fixed prices, they are not going to have incentives to try to sell their output in the more profitable market, which is uh, those markets in which the dominant producers are exercising more market power. So if they fail to arbitrage, uh, then uh, these dominant producers are going to have an additional tool for market power, which is uh, price discrimination, and therefore paying producers according to fixed prices is going to strengthen their, their market power. So whereas we document this theoretically, uh, we want to go to the data and see which of these two effects uh, dominate. And, and again, in the Spanish electricity uh, market, we find these natural experiments by which between 2012 and 2014, uh, the pricing scheme for renewables uh, changed uh, twice. And this allows us to casually identify the effects uh, of paying fixed prices on market power. We document that these two countervailing effects are at play. Uh, and in in order to see which of the two dominated, what we do is we measure, we leverage on our structural estimates uh, to try to measure what were the markups that firms were charging uh, under the various pricing regimes. So from profit maximization, we get the standard result that the equilibrium prices are equal to the marginal cost of the price setting unit plus a markup component. And this market component is, affecting, is affected by the pricing schemes, essentially because when this indicator of function equals one, which is when firms face fixed prices, they internalize the price effect over a smaller share of their output, but also the pricing schemes might affect the slope of the residual demand uh, phase by each uh, of these uh, firms. Certainly, one would expect that arbitrage makes this residual demand uh, more elastic, that, that therefore enhancing, uh, sorry, mitigating market power. We see all the bids submitted in this market, so we can construct this residual demand, we can compute uh, the elasticity, and therefore we can, we can measure the markups and see how they change uh, across uh, price regimes, which is what we see in the next figure. So essentially, here, the black line represents the distribution of estimated markups when firms were subject to fixed prices. And this distribution uh, implies that market power was lower as compared to those uh, cases in which uh, firms were sub subject uh, to uh, market prices. So uh, what this suggests is that this uh, forward contract effect dominates over the arbitrage effect, uh, giving rise to more competitive uh, outcomes. On top of these pro-competitive effects of paying renewables according to fixed prices, there's other benefits, certainly for investments. If, re if renewables face prices that are certain, that are fixed for the future, they see less risk ahead, their risk premium go down, and therefore their investment uh, cost uh, go down. 
So, so we are going to rely on, on paying renewables according to fixed prices. The question is how are we are going to be setting uh, these prices? And, and the answer is, is well known uh, to all of us and it's uh, widely spread these days uh, in practice. We have seen what we can refer to as an auction revolution in many countries, certainly in Europe. Governments are, are relying on auctions in order to set these fixed prices. Uh, for, for renewables, but here there's, there's many answers that we still uh, need to provide. For instance, how are we going to run this auction, auction design? How much quantity are we uh, going to be demanding in these auctions? That is, how much investment in renewables uh, do you want there uh, to be taking place? How often do we want to uh, run these auctions? Uh, as well as many of the questions, but the one that I'm going to be focusing on is which technologies should we put to compete together uh, in this auction? Uh, let me say that uh, in Europe, the European Commission is promoting technology neutral auctions. So essentially they want uh, governments to run auctions in which whoever has a plan for renewable investment, whether it's solar, wind, whatever it is, they have to be allowed to compete uh, in the same auction. Um, however, we see that many countries are run uh, technology specific auctions and this is the question that we want to address uh, in this paper with uh, Juan Pablo Montero. When is it uh, optimal to, to run technology neutral auctions and whether it, and if so when is it optimal to run technology specific auctions. Um, so so let, me, let me go through the main ingredients uh, of the model um, and we can think of this as a general procurement model or we can uh, fix ideas by thinking of, of to technology, solar and wind. So, so these one good, say, renewable investments can be produced, provided with multiple technologies, solar and wind. These technologies, they have linear marginal cost. Um, they have an intercept, which is subject to shocks, uh, with a variance uh, sigma and uh, cost uh, shocks are correlated with a parameter uh, uh, raw. So this variance somehow is reflecting the information asymmetries. The regulator doesn't really know the cost of, of, of these technologies. She cares about social benefits. Uh, so to be very neutral here and not to bias the results, we assume that these technologies are equally beneficial. So investing in solar, investing in wind, uh, the regulator is, is totally indifferent. She just cares about the total amount of, of investment. She wants to minimize uh, investment costs, so she would like to pick the most efficient technologies to, uh, um, uh, to, for this investment. But at the same time, she also wants, she cares about consumers. She would like to minimize the payments by consumers, which we capture through a cost of public funds uh, lambda. And what we find is that there is a fundamental rent sufficiency trade-off in the choice of whether we want to run technology neutral, technology-specific auction. Clearly, technology neutrality, that is putting wind and solar to compete together in the same auction, is good for investment efficiency because the quantities that are allocated to one or another are going to adjust to these uh, cost shocks. However, we might be leaving uh, very high rents uh, to the suppliers and we can avoid some of these rents through a technology specific uh, approach. Essentially, with a technology specific approach, the regulator has this additional degree of freedom by choosing the quantity to be uh, procured from each technology. This might come up at the expense of efficiency, uh, but it would uh, allow uh, possibly to save on uh, payments by consumers. So to illustrate this, let me show you some data that we have collated, collected also in the Spanish electricity market. So we got data of all the ongoing um, renewals project. We have data on whether they are located. We have historical weather data so as to be able to compute uh, their expected production. We know the technology of these projects, the size and so on and so forth, so that we can compute the average cost of all these individual projects and rank them from low cost to high cost. So here the red dots represent solar projects and the blue dots represent uh, wind projects. If we were to run a technology neutral auction so that these, all these technologies would be competing in the same auction, and if the regulator wanted to procure 4,000 uh, megas, this would be the market clearing price. And clearly all those projects with lower costs would be uh, carrying out the investment. So this would be the allocation, the technology neutral allocation uh, for these two um, uh, technologies. Clearly solar gets very high uh, rents because on average their costs uh, are lower. So 
what could we do if we instead rely on a technology specific approach well we could clearly distort the quantities with respect to what is efficient from a cost minimization uh, perspective and this would cause us to reduce the quantity that we procure from solar which would uh, uh, substantially reduce the price that we would pay for these uh, projects and make up the difference uh, with an increase in the quantity that we procure for wind this would increase the price for wind but clearly the increase in these payments uh, is more than weighted by the savings on what we pay to the solar uh, investors. We're incurring inefficiencies, yes, because we are calling uh, some projects with higher marginal costs of the projects that we are no longer uh, carrying, uh, but this efficiency loss, again, is more than compensated uh, by the cost of the public funds of whatever we save. If there was no uncertainty, this technology a specific approach would clearly dominate, but think not that simple in the presence of information asymmetries. Why? Because through a technology specific approach, we have to commit on certain quantities, uh, and these quantities would be inflexible to whatever cost realization uh, we get. So, if there's a lot of uncertainty, uh, the cost of this inflexibility can be very high, making technology neutrality better. So the formula that summarizes, and I don't really want to go into the details, but uh, the formula that summarizes the choice between one approach and the, on the other is the following one. In the first term, what we have is the efficiency gain under technology neutrality, which is allowing for quantity adjustment, which depends on the amount of asymmetric information and the amount of uh, cost correlation. Whereas the second term is reflecting the excess rents that are left with the most efficient uh, suppliers, which depend on, on the extent of overcompensation, which is a function of how different these technologies are, and the cost of public funds. So it's not always true that we should go for a technology neutral approach. In particular, the technology specific approach should be preferred if there is small information asymmetries or if there is high cost correlation between these technologies because quantity adjustment would not be such a big issue. And it should also be uh, preferred whenever the cost of these rents is too high, which is when there's a high concern for rents. And also when these technologies are very asymmetric, so the extent of overcompensation uh, would be very large. So if we were asked by, by a regulator, should I really stick to the European Commission advice of always preferring technology neutrality or not, then our answer should be, we should really go case by case and measure uh, what is going on uh, in, each, in each country. Don't have a blacklist of, of practices, don't put uh, technology specific options in the blacklist, because on a case by case basis, sometimes uh, that might be uh, preferred. John, are there any questions that you want me to clarify before I jump into the last block? Um, thank you. Um, well, welcome any questions from um, those attending. But could I ask one just on what you've been discussing with the on technology <laughs> neutrality? Why is the solar curve, the red dots, that's kind of backwards L shape there exactly. Whereas the, the, the wind one is, is very different. Why, why is it so different, those two shapes? Um, in, in, in wind sites, there's a lot of heterogeneity in how much wind there is in one region or another. Uh, however, in, in solar, there's less heterogeneity across uh, locations. And um, uh, in our cost function, we have um, some economies of scale. So these are probably these very small projects uh, for which uh, costs uh, go, go up because they're very little. Whereas in terms of wind plants, uh, uh, essentially all the wind uh, mills, they are kind of large and there's less heterogeneity in terms of, of size. So um, uh, this happens to be the case given the data that we have from the projects that have asked for, for permission. Uh, but again, there's, there's many differences across uh, technologies and the determinants of the cost uh, vary uh, between one another. Because on solar, it, it almost looks like there's some capacity constraint there which I'm sure there is in the short run, but in the longer run, you imagine it's not vertical. Yeah, I think those are really the tiny little uh, okay. solar, the tiny little solar farms for which our cost function gives uh, very, very 
very high cost. Or maybe uh, farms are located in, in, lo in locations that are not uh, very sunny in the north of Spain. But um, I would say the, 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 what is very robust is the fact that uh, nowadays, given the current state of, of the technology, solar is cheaper than wind. Uh, so if for whatever reason in the auction, uh, both wind and solar end up uh, winning, wind is going to be setting the marginal price for solar, and solar is going to be getting high rents. Um, so uh, this is the reason why I would uh, sometimes pay to separate these two uh, auctions so as not to give that high rents uh, to the solar producers. Uh, so clearly, Mike, sorry, yeah. Mike, on this, Mike uh, Waterson has just asked the sharp question: Does this mean that rooftop solar is a bad thing? <laughs> well, there's there's many reasons why it is a good thing, but certainly not from a cost uh, minimization perspective. The large uh, solar farms uh, that you find in the countryside, they are far more efficient than rooftop solar. But uh, rooftop solar engages the population into the energy transition. It saves on, uh, on the need to invest in transmission. Um, so uh, these are very different uh, technologies in a way, even if they are both solar. And rooftop solar is far more, rooftop solar is much more expensive. It is, yeah. In fact, I recall in at Maastricht, Erie, that was the topic of, uh, or related topic, uh, I think it was Frank Mavone on a, a plenary session on that occasion. Fine, yeah. let, let, let me not delay uh, you any further, Natalia, and there might be some time at the very end for further okay. questions, but, but back to you with thanks. Okay, I'll, I'll jump into the last uh, uh, section. Uh, so as I said before, there are limits to renewables because they're intermittent and we need to find ways, solutions to facilitate the integration of renewables because otherwise uh, without these solutions we might face a mismatch between uh, demand and supply. By the way, uh, maybe some of you have read last week there were um, uh, capacity problems uh, in California. Essentially temperatures were extremely uh, high so they had to uh, uh, run uh, some um, uh, curtailment because there was not enough uh, capacity to satisfy this, this peak in demand. Some people were blaming on the fact that uh, uh, California has gone very far in terms of, of renewables. I think that is not the right diagnosis. The right diagnosis is that they haven't put in place uh, yet solutions to facilitate the integration of renewables, which can come from either the demand side or, or the uh, supply side. One of them is dynamic pricing. So if we charge consumers uh, prices that reflect really the marginal cost of producing electricity and if they are price responsive, then we might get some, adjust some adjustment through the um, demand side or we can get uh, similar outcomes uh, through a storage. So a storage uh, which can take, again, we are talking about the storage as if there was just one thing, but there's, there's a huge richness in terms of the storage solutions, including pump, pump hydro or batteries or electric uh, vehicles. In any case, through a storage, we could be uh, demanding electricity when there's lots of renewables and releasing that electricity that, ha that has been stored at times when there's not enough renewables. So both solutions uh, would contribute to, to facilitating the integration of renewables. And on top of that, there would be further benefits such as uh, reducing production costs as they would be, for instance, storage uh, consuming at times of low production costs and releasing while substituting more uh, uh, costly uh, uh, sources of production, would avoid investing in idle capacity and would further mitigate uh, market power. Uh, the issue is, can we really rely on these solutions and what should the policy be towards uh, uh, these solutions? Let me first uh, summarize, give you the main takeaway of the project that uh, we are about to finish with Marmer Wand uh, and David Rapson, in which we ask ourselves, while pricing electricity in a way that reflects the marginal cost of producing electricity is certainly necessary, if we want consumers uh, to respond, is it sufficient or do we need something else? And in order to answer this question, Again, um, we are lucky, we were lucky to have uh, access to a huge data set from two utility companies uh, in Spain. They gave us hourly electricity consumption data for more households than we can really work with, with more than 2 million Spanish households, over a period in which uh, Spanish electricity consumers by default 
um, are charged real-time prices. So, so those prices that are set in the electricity, in the wholesale electricity auctions, they are directly passed on to the Spanish household. This is what we refer to as real-time uh, pricing. And as far as we are aware, as aware of, Spain is the only country where this is the case. So it provides a unique opportunity to really try to understand uh, whether uh, um, demand side response can really help us uh, integrate renewables in this, in this market. So what we do is that we use price variation over time to really identify household by household their short-run uh, price elasticity. So in this standard uh, regression, what uh, our parameter of interest is beta, which is capturing the short-run price elasticity. And next, I'm going to show you what the results uh, look like. So here we have two figures. So this is the data set from one utility company and this is the data set from the other utility company. And here we plot the distribution of the estimated short run price elasticities at the household level. And what we can see is that the distributions that are both centered around zero uh, with a median of no response whatsoever. So what these uh, data, what these results show is that uh, Spanish consumers don't seem to be responding to changes in electricity uh, uh, prices, in hourly electricity uh, prices. On top of this, um, we can also resort to another comparison, which is we have some group of consumers, almost randomly chosen group of consumers, who are not facing these real-time electricity prices. And if we perform the same exercise, and if I plot the betas, you cannot see there, it's the, it's the, it's the lighter um, um, line, what we find is that the two distributions are almost identical, meaning uh, consumers facing fixed prices versus consumers facing real-time prices, they don't seem to be behaving differently. So what can we get out of this evidence? At I least think one a clarifying yeah. question has been yeah. asked. How, how do consumers say in Spain, how do they know about real-time pricing? Well, that is, that is a, a great question because one of the necessary conditions is that consumers must be aware and probably many people are not aware of the fact that uh, their bill is computed uh, by multiplying the hourly price with the hourly uh, consumption. So this is one of the main reasons why we are seeing no response. Probably people are simply not aware. Um, the second reason is that if price differences are not large enough, even if I am aware, and, and believe me, I am aware, and believe me, I do not respond. I do not change my consumption every day. I don't go to the computer to check what are the prices for today's electricity consumption. Because even if I did, probably the price differences are not large enough in order to pay uh, me to, uh, you know, in order to make it worth it for me to pay attention and change my consumption patterns according to those prices. Could there be automatic devices that would do the job for me? Probably, but the price differences are so little that probably that would not even pay for that. So maybe in the future, if there's more renewables and this brings more price dispersion, as I showed in the first theoretical paper, probably price differences are going to be larger and probably um, those consumers who are aware might have incentives to respond. But as of now, real-time pricing doesn't seem to be making any difference. Does this mean that we have to give up on, on demand side as a solution for uh, the integration of renewables? Certainly not. I don't think that is the case. It just simply means that we have to find a smart uh, pricing solution. So if consumers are not smart enough or if they are smart enough so that they know that it doesn't pay to respond, our response has to be a smart pricing. That is use some time of some type of dynamic pricing so that uh, consumers um, uh, really have incentives to be engaged. How can we do it? For instance, time of use prices, they are set in advance. So we consumers don't need to be checking the computer every day to see, to see the prices. We know what those prices are gonna be and those price differences are gonna be more salient. So in this paper, we also find that time of use prices seem to be more effective in achieving this demand response. However, they don't fully address this intermittency. They address intermittency when this intermittency is coming from uh, seasonal uh, changes in prices that could be driven, for instance, by changes in solar production because of sunrise and sunset. But they would not be able to address changes in prices that are due, for instance, uh, um, to changes in wind because wind is more stochastic. 
So, so we really have to come up uh, with a smart pricing policies that probably combine uh, real-time prices with time of use prices so that uh, we get the sweet spot of uh, more engagement, but also more response to real-time price changes that cannot be captured uh, with seasonal uh, price adjustments. I don't have much time to tell you about, uh, I believe, an exciting project that I'm working on with Andres uh, Terezo, a student from the EUI on storage, but I, I would like to tell you a couple of words uh, before I, I conclude about the storage. Uh, because storage is, is called to play a key role in the energy, tr in the energy transition. Just like demand response, uh, storage needs la large price differences over time to make it worthwhile. Why? Because storage owners really they make arbitrage profits by buying electricity which they store when prices are low and selling it uh, when prices are high. The main difference I would say between uh, storage and, and, and demand response is that uh, a storage needs heavy investments in long, in long live assets. So even if price differences today make it worthwhile to invest in, in, in storage, uh, if investors expect that in the future those price differences are going to fade away, probably because they expect that there's going to be a lot of storage, which is in itself uh, going to close down uh, the price differences, even if it's profitable today, they might not have incentives uh, to do so because of the expectation of a smaller price differences. Furthermore, storage creates positive externalities between arbitrage profits that uh, private investors would not capture, such as improvement in security of supply. But what we really focus on in the paper is the distortions that uh, market power in storage together with uh, market power in energy create both for the use and for the, invest uh, and for the investment decisions uh, in storage. And the reason is that unlike demand response, uh, when we think of demand response, when we think of individual consumers, we always think of these consumers as being price takers. This need not be the case with storage. If these storage owners are large, so think, for instance, of Tesla investing in batteries in, in California, and sometimes they're also vertically integrated with, with the generators, uh, meaning that whenever they decide whether and when they want to use this, these batteries, they internalize the price impacts of their decisions, both on their profits through storage, as well as on their profits uh, that they get uh, through generation if they're uh, vertically integrated. So what we highlight in the paper is that uh, uh, it really matters who owns and who is operating uh, the storage uh, facilities. Uh, what we find is that market power in storage and in generation might give rise to underutilization of storage. So even if the storage capacities are there, uh, firms with market power in either storage or in generation that are vertically integrated will not be using those assets uh, efficiently. And we might also find underinvestment uh, in a storage. Uh, in essence, uh, this would be both a, a monopsony uh, when the storage facilities buy and a monopoly when they sell. The combination of the two uh, might uh, really distort uh, the incentives. A storage is an area where regulation is underdeveloped and whether we develop it in one direction or the other, meaning uh, who is allowed to operate these facilities, who is allowed to invest in these uh, facilities, might make a big difference as to whether we are really going to get the storage and therefore whether we are going to uh, be able to afford having more removes in the market. So, John, if I may, let me, let me conclude by highlighting that I believe that the energy transition is truly a key economic and social challenge for our generation. It really matters how we design it. Uh, a good design uh, might allow us to achieve the energy transition at least cost, uh, both for firms as well as for consumers. Uh, a bad design can really imply the whole failure of the energy transition, would be, which would be uh, highly costly for society. I think that we, IA researchers, we have quite a lot of uh, knowledge and expertise to talk about uh, these issues, even if we are not energy experts. Uh, we know quite a lot about many of the issues that are at stake here, uh, including, as I said, competition, market design, entry, 
uh, investment incentives and how this all impacts on, on, on policy. I've been talking about electricity, but clearly the energy transition is more than that. It includes transportation, cities, practicing taxation, trade policy, consumers' uh, behavior. And we can be looking at these issues, combining theory, empirical work, experiments. So I think this, this is also another very appealing uh, feature of the area. Uh, in energy markets, in the energy transition, there's uh, many other expertise working on it. There's certainly engineers as well as many others. I think that our, our competitive advantage uh, as I economists is that we understand that incentives matter, that there is a strategic behavior out there, and we know how to measure the effects of policies. We know that one policy on another can make a big difference, and this is probably something that I'm missing in other type of, of approaches. So uh, we're in demand, and I think we can make a big difference. So I encourage all of you who try to contribute to work on this area, because uh, it, it really matters. Thank you so much. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Natalia. I don't know if you want to leave the slides up, if you want to refer back or or to unshare them at this point, totally, totally up to you. Now, we have good time. We've got um, 10 minutes or so for further Q&A and uh, welcome questions from participants. Natal, you can, if you want to open up the Q&A box yourself, absolutely fine, but let me draw attention to a couple uh, that have been logged. David Byrne had a point quite close to what you were saying in response to the question about consumer awareness uh, of renewables and pricing. I mean, as, as devices get more and more automated, then the, the scope for real-time demand side responses, e even household level, never mind uh, industrial, uh, grows. So there's that comment there. And then um, further up the string, there were a couple of questions again from Paul Hyde, who's, um, one of which um, is about a different topic that, that, than has been covered so far, which is how do the intra-European international aspects of all this work? Um, could a Spanish solar producer sell or, or commit power to um, a French or even further away German auction? I think that would be quite interesting to hear a little bit about because the, you know, how intense competition is in these auctions will no doubt depend on those geographic issues uh, in considerable part. Excellent, thank you so much. Let me start with the second one, which I think is, is fascinating. We are given national solutions to these energy and environmental problems, but certainly the national boundaries mean nothing whenever we are facing a global problem such as uh, uh, climate change. So uh, myself, I've, I've been advocating for a European-wide auction for renewables because it doesn't make any sense to have lots of investment in solar in Germany just because the, the German government is very keen on, on, on pushing for, for renewables and have less of it in Spain or in Italy or in Greece. That is an inefficient location decision because the same investment located in another country would allow us to get more uh, renewable electricity out of it and therefore uh, be less costly, be uh, more efficient. Uh, so, so why don't we run uh, European-wide uh, renewable auctions so that we'll be getting uh, more of it uh, at, lower, at lower prices? Uh, I guess there is political economy issues as to uh, why, um, um, I don't know, German consumers or Danish consumers, they might not like to pay for uh, investments in renewables that take place uh, in Spain, uh, but uh, there is other positive sides to it. If we invest whatever it is and if we manage to get more renewable energy out of it, the prices that the German consumers or Danish consumers are going to be paying for their electricity is going to be lower because of these pricing uh, uh, effects of renewables. And in any case, there could be uh, compensations across countries or, or you name it. But the important uh, uh, issue is that investments have to be located in those places uh, where they are more more efficient. So I think there is quite a, a lot of uh, scope of, of improvement in, in these auctions. And in my opinion, the more European-wide we go, the better outcomes we are going to get. Uh, 
Um, in a way, we are trying to do so. The European Commission is pushing for interconnecting uh, countries. And again, the more European-wide we get through interconnection, the better it's going to be for security of supply. And, and clearly, building interconnection capacity is also a way uh, to cope with, with renewables. Because whenever there's a lot of uh, sun in Spain, uh, then if we have the transmission capacity to export that electricity to other countries, then we would be coping uh, with the lack of renewal availability in other countries and, and so on and so forth. So, so interconnection, I think, is, is also uh, um, a big issue. And there's a lot of IO questions there regarding how you allocate this interconnection capacity, how you set the prices for the use of this interconnection capacity, who should be allowed to invest in these interconnectors, um, and so on and so forth. Just on that, if I may, no, sorry, the, the, the last time I read about this was a long time ago. The, the bottleneck issues were, were a big deal. Uh, maybe it's changed with technology and engineering. And the, the, loss, the power losses were really quite considerable. So there weren't lots of free lunches lying around uh, in this area. You know, e even within uh, the, the UK, never mind um, longer, uh, longer stretches. Absolutely. So whenever there's lack of transmission capacity that creates a, bottle, a bottleneck, not only there's uh, inefficient outcomes, because say, if there's a bottleneck, meaning that in a location I cannot import cheaper electricity from outside, it means that a more expensive generator has to be turned off in the, in the, in the congested area, therefore creating an inefficiency. But it also creates lots of competition problems, because if I am within a congested area, essentially I have monopoly power in this local market, even though in the big market or in the big system, which is not truly really a market if it's not integrated, um, uh, I might look small. So uh, clearly, the more we invest in transmission capacity, the more we invest in interconnection capacity, clearly doing a cost-benefit analysis, uh, the better outcomes uh, we are gonna uh, we are gonna get. And 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 I agree with with what you said. Uh, there is many opportunities out there so as to improve uh, these outcomes. So I haven't been talking about this because I haven't been doing research on, on this issue lately, uh, but I think this is a, a very promising and a, a very policy relevant area of work, everything that uh, regards transmission, uh, transmission capacity. Because for instance, think of, of a generator who is in a congested area. Does this generator have incentives to build this these lines so as to reduce the congestion? Certainly not, because this is going to bring in uh, competitors. So again, who is allowed to invest and who should be deciding on these uh, transmission investments uh, is, is something which is critical and which is key. Regarding the, only, the other question by David on the automated uh, devices to allow for this demand response, absolutely. I think this automation is going to uh, improve the demand response, uh, uh, which poses the question of, for instance, why if in Spain we have real-time prices, why don't we have automatic devices? Uh, is it because there is a market failure? Or is it because the price differences do not even pay for these uh, devices, even if they are very inexpensive? So um, this is one issue. And, and the other issue is that uh, suppose that uh, uh, price differences become large enough and these devices become um, uh, cheap enough so that uh, we install them, there is a limit uh, to that demand response. Because I'm giving this lecture now, I cannot turn off the electricity even if it's uh, very expensive, right? So, so there is, there is, there's, there's a limit to how much, uh, how much demand response uh, we can get of it. Clearly, the more automatic uh, we get, the more response we are going to get. But that response, uh, even if it's very welcome, it's limited. And for sure, we are going to have to resort uh, to start solutions and to transmission solutions to allow for more renewables into the market. Great, thank you. Um, again, please enter in the Q&A. We've got a, just a few more minutes. Can I um, pick up another comment of Paul's and, and it rather expand it, which is about inefficient subsidies. So you, you've, you've taken a you know, mainstream efficiency uh, perspective, sort of wealth economics perspective on all this. If one approached it from a, a very different angle of 
uh, noting that there are huge subsidies being sloshed around uh, in this arena. And if you look in terms of rent seeking behavior, um, do you have any, any observations on how policy is developing should develop in that rather more um, cynically minded context? Absolutely. I think there's a lot of subsidies, both for renewables as well as for conventional uh, power sources. And there's tons of rent seeking um, uh, going on and um, uh, this creates inefficiencies that we should clearly fight. Uh, for conventional resources, we are paying them capacity payments. That is payments that uh, uh, were not in place when firms carry out their investments. Now they see that uh, they are not breaking even because they are not producing as much as they would like to and they are producing at lower prices because prices are getting lower because of renewables and they um, do their rent seeking and, and ask for capacity payments uh, at times when they are justified and needed but also at times when they are not. Um, there is also inefficient um, subsidies uh, in other areas but I think we have to distinguish between what is a subsidy and, and what is not, or, or whether one subsidy is optimal or not optimal. So uh, when it comes to renewables or when it comes to storage solutions, we know there is a lot of learning by doing uh, economies. And some of these subsidies could well have been justified because of these uh, externalities. We wanted to push these investments to get these cost reductions, uh, and now we've got them. Um, I think with uh, renewables, sometimes there's this misunderstanding. There's this, this understanding that we are paying subsidies to renewables. Currently, we are not. Uh, so the new options that have taken place in Europe last, uh, last week in Portugal, an amazing outcome came out of these new uh, renewables options. The prices that are coming out for renewables out of these options are well below the prices that we are paying for the conventional resources. So I think it's, it's, it's time to start thinking that not only renewables cost us and cost us inefficient subsidies, uh, they're allowing us uh, uh, to save uh, payments. Rent seeking and, and subsidies and, and so on and so forth is something that uh, uh, worries us uh, in our paper with Juan Pablo Montero when we uh, say that sometimes these technology specific auctions uh, might be preferred. There, there's the risk that uh, uh, rent seeking and, and, and vested interest would um, influence the regulators so as to set quantity quotas that are not necessarily the efficient ones. So when in that paper we are comparing the technology neutral approach versus the technology specific approach, we are relying on these quantities that are procured from one technology and the other to be the efficient ones. But clearly there is more scope to influence this choice of, 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 of quantity uh, in a technology specific approach and not in a technology neutral approach where the outcome is simply uh, the result of this competitive uh, process. So I believe another area, another exciting area of research, one that I haven't uh, been working on, but I think is extremely important, is to uh, blend, to mix political economy issues into these market design and regulatory issues, because uh, in practice, uh, those influences and those incentives for rent seeking uh, really matter. Great. So we've got this one or two minutes left, to, um, and some more Q&A comments have come in. Some you might want to deal with off, offline because we are so short of time, but I think Ryan Hill has logged an important point about um, incentives to invest in improvements in renewables as well as in the in capacity and in the interconnection facilities. And that too could have market design um, uh, issues arising from that too. So I don't know if maybe if we take that as the, the, the last little theme for you to comment on, then we can wrap. But there are some questions we haven't had time for. And uh, as I say, you might uh, want to deal with those offline entirely up to you. Okay, so very briefly on this last issue, it's, it's super important market design for investment incentives. And it's not just about how much we want to invest and where we want to locate the investments, but also whether we want to invest in more efficient uh, installations. Uh, so, for instance, to refer to one of the issues that I raised, if we pay as a function of energy, we are, and not as a function of capacity, we are clearly given more incentives for more efficient installations and for a better maintenance 
of those installations so that the same capacity is able to produce more. Whereas if we pay as a function of capacity, which is uh, done in, in some countries, clearly they don't have incentives to produce more and therefore they don't have incentives to invest in improving that efficiency. So absolutely, these uh, market design choices will be critical uh, for, for those investments. Fantastic. So it is now um, quarter past the hour. So our, our time is up. I said at the very beginning that the way to start a conference is uh, to have a great speaker on a great topic. And um, we've certainly had both of those things. Uh, we're incredibly grateful to you, Natalia, for, for the talk, but also for um, this, whole, this whole body of work which you and your co-authors, and of course others, uh, are engaged in. It is um, fantastically important. You've encouraged uh, us in the IO economics world, uh, uh, both in the importance of these topics and in the role that potentially uh, we, or more particularly you, can play in all this. And um, I want to thank you very much indeed on behalf of all of us. I want you to imagine a lot of virtual applause uh, yeah. going around the world uh, as we speak. Um, and I'm sure it's very much heartfelt. So we're extremely grateful to you. Thank you very, very much. It's been a great pleasure. Thank you so much, John. And I wish you a great Erie 2020 conference. Thank you. So the conference continues in, um, uh, in 10 minutes or so at half past the hour where uh, those attending have a choice between um, two um, uh, uh, parallel sessions. So you pick one of the two. One is on vertical restraints and investment um, and stars Janine miklos and Scott Commoners. The other is on empirical analysis of oligopoly, Greg Crawford and David Byrne. Um, so make your choice and um, please come back in 10 minutes for what I'm sure will be another very, very stimulating session. And then again, there's more tomorrow and on Sunday. Thanks very much to everyone. Bye for now.